technologies working so far. The um, concept of water safety planning is probably appreciated by the audience. The sanitation safety plans were introduced by the World Health Organization in 2015. And really, both plans have the same objective, and that is to protect public health. Throughout the history of humanity, our settlements have been associated with waterborne disease outbreaks. Doesn't matter where you are, the risks exist. In its extreme form, in the developing world, there are many challenges around water and sanitation. And I'll talk on Thursday morning about humanitarian emergencies. And these are photographs from East Africa where I worked in June and July this year on the cholera response. If we can't separate the waste from humans or the waste from animals from our food supply or our water supply, and we have communities where there is a high prevalence of open defecation, some of the nomadic communities in East Africa do not have a single toilet. You have open defecation, you have the risk of contaminating a water supply, the consequence is massive outbreaks of cholera. This is a challenge for the world, but we hope for those who live in developed nations that we can manage the risks associated with sanitation. Uh, here, a, a, a snapshot of the water safety plan. Really, the process of water safety planning provides us an opportunity to identify potential hazards, assess the risk, and put in place effective controls for those risks. Similarly, sanitation safety planning prompts us to think about the sanitation process associated with all sources, humans, agriculture, animals, and to look at the pathways, to look at where the waste goes. What are the possible routes of exposure? What are the possible beneficial reuses for the products of the sanitary process? One of the strongest elements of water safety planning and sanitation safety planning is the ability to foster collaboration between sectors. Rarely will the water authority or the operator of the sanitation system have complete control of the land or the policies or the programs. So we need to talk to the stakeholders, whether it's the farmers, the organisations responsible for regulation, the community, about what they might do to manage risks. So a slide, you probably won't read the detail, but in essence, there are a lot of similarities between water safety plans and sanitation safety plans from the World Health Organisation. This is from the WHO Sanitation Safety Plan guidance. Each of them prompts a consideration of a catchment, of an impact on a catchment or on a water source as one of the possible pathways for contamination and for risk to disease. Both have the objective of protecting public health. There are potentially greater challenges around sanitation safety planning than water safety planning. With water safety, you can put in place treatment barriers even if your control of the catchment is not perfect. In sanitation planning, you may not have good control over the activities and the land uses that occur. A reflection on Australia. For more than 50,000 years, the Indigenous Australians managed their water resource. It was something profound and deep in their culture, something fundamental to their survival. Within, I would say, years, if not weeks, of European settlement in Australia, the picture was very different. So there was supplying the colony of Sydney that became New South Wales, a single stream known as the tank stream that supplied the drinking water. And I will read an extract from the Lieutenant Governor who issued an order very promptly about the contamination of this stream. An indulgence had been allowed to some of the military and others, which is now found to have produced an evil, having permitted to build themselves huts on each side and near of the stream of which water was supplied to the town of Sydney. They had, for convenience of procuring water, opened the paling in the fence and made paths from each hut by which in rainy weather a great quantity of filth ran into the stream, polluting the water. And it, it goes on. His account was published in the Government Gazette and the penalty, the penalty for someone found guilty of the offence was to have his house pulled down. Very straightforward. It wasn't until a hundred years later that Sydney got pure dam water. In the intervening period, diseases like typhoid were very prevalent in the, in the colony and they could be attributed to poor sewerage, poor sanitation and waste from dairy farms. That's recorded in the history. 
So here, Dr Theo Kendall, medical officer of what became the Sydney Water Board, noticed and noted the benefit of constructing sewers. And a cartoon from a 1920s newspaper promoting the connection to the sewer and the risk of disease if you didn't. Basically, the mortality from diarrhoea decreased dramatically by separating the sewage from the drinking water sources. This is all history. The reduction in typhoid mortality in the colony of New South Wales, I'm sure if it was uh, to be recorded elsewhere, very similar trends could be seen. Um, in the country, the predecessors in my role in, in the State Health Department recorded the conditions, the sanitary conditions in various towns. Uh, the lower town photographed here, people ingested typhoid bacteria in drinking water contaminated by sewage. Um, the town shown in the upper photograph had a better sanitary service until the scavenger, the person responsible to empty the toilets, went on a bender lasting some weeks in 1910, during which time the privy pans were filled but not removed. The flies feasted and the people careless about the purity of food and drink contracted typhoid. History. Now, I think it was uh, Jamie who said we need some trigger events. Well, trigger events might help us along the way to improve our actions. Here is a lake, Wallace Lake in New South Wales. In November 1996, heavy, heavy rain, washed contamination from septic tanks. There is development all around the edge of the lake. Waste from septic tanks got into the water. This waste caused massive outbreak of hepatitis A. 467 cases attributed to this outbreak, one death from the consumption of contaminated oysters harvested from this lake. The benefit, if there can be a benefit from such tragic events, is the tightening of regulation for on-site waste management, the septic tanks and aerated wastewater treatment systems where there is not town sewer. This brought in a regulatory requirement for the local council to approve the installation of septic tanks, to inspect, and for the homeowners to take some responsibility for what was on their land. These concepts now exist in the WHO guidance on sanitation safety planning to ensure that the fate of all wastewater streams are understood and exposures are assessed. Another important trigger event in Australia was the Sydney water incident in 1998. At times, massive detections of cryptosporidium in the filtered drinking water after massive filling of the dam, many, many years of drought. The level in the main dam went from 50% capacity to 100% and overflowing in a matter of days. This brought whatever contamination had sat in the catchment for years into the dam. The laboratories found cryptosporidium. Very promptly, a boil water alert was issued. There was no illness that could be attributed to this, despite heightened surveillance. What do we believe? That the bugs present, the cryptosporidium and giardia that was found, was likely not to be infectious and likely not to be viable because it had sat in the environment for a long period of time before it was brought into the catchment relatively. So a consequence on a city boiling its drinking water, and this lasted for three months, is phenomenal. And it focuses the government's attention. It focuses the community's attention. And it's, it's uh, sad that it comes to this. So there was many, many volumes to the Sydney Water Inquiry. It brought in tighter regulation in the catchments, the establishment of a catchment authority. And with it, the framework for the management of drinking water quality into the Australian drinking water guidelines very similar to the WHO concept of water safety planning and many, many guidance documents. This incident happened just one year after the control of septic tanks was tightened. So when the, the Sydney Catchment Authority was formed and they started to look in the catchment, they saw many problems with septic tanks, with the, the absorption trenches, the land application areas simply were not doing their job. Lots of opportunity for improvement. I should mention the catchments serving Sydney are not bushland and pristine. There's 16,000 square kilometres of catchment feeding a network of 11 dams. 140,000 people live in the catchments. There are um, seven sewage treatment plants in the catchment. There are 23 dairy farms. Of those dairy farms, and the, the, the top left photograph shows the Sydney Catchment Authority officer working on one of the dairy farms, 19 have had containment facilities built on site, dams to stop the runoff of water into the catchment from the dairy farms. I just want to find the statistic because this intervention alone has stopped 156,000 litres of waste from the dairy, farm, dairy farms each day reaching the catchment. 156,000 litres per day stopped. 
There were upgrades to sewage treatment plants. There were fencing of critical streams. This was achieved over almost 20 years of effort. And it's not something that was done with a big stick, but it was done by slow and steady conversation, by engagement with the landowners, by engagement with the farmers, by offering grants and saying, together we can do something better for the community. There are, there are challenges in this approach and um, not always a good outcome. But here, some other photos from the Sydney Catchment Authority, now known as Water New South Wales, of their uh, promotion work with revegetation, engaging with farmers and also engaging with encroaching urban development where towns are growing into the catchment. The city's growing. Here, a country town, another near miss. We believe a near miss. Uh, like New Zealand, we value sheep in Australia. And these uh, southern New South Wales towns have massive, massive uh, grazing activity. In this town, the sheep were allowed to graze right to the edge of the storage dam where water was abstracted for the town drinking water supply. Our monitoring picked this up through detection of E. coli. Apparently, we could not find any illness despite the surveillance that was put in place. Maybe there was endemic disease that wasn't attributed, but very, very quickly when the E. coli was found in the samples, a boil water alert was put in place. The town had the ability to control some of the risk by controlling the, the sheep coming right to the edge of the water. They also were having a pretty poor chlorination practice. They weren't uh, maintaining an adequate chlorine residual and in fact they were keeping no records of the chlorination of the plant. This has changed in New South Wales with the Public Health Act that requires a water safety plan of each water supplier and very close uh, attention to their activities. In towns like this, proper implementation of sanitation safety planning, thinking about the fate of the waste coming from animals and thinking about the consequence on the water treatment plant that was less than 100 metres away, might have uh, prompted improvements. Around the state of New South Wales, local councils can make local environmental plans. These are local planning laws that control what activity might occur on the council, within the council area. And many councils, not all, but many are now picking up drinking water catchments as an activity to be controlled in local environmental planning. So you can't take away a farm that is already there, but if a new farm is proposed, the council has the right to pose questions about the potential for it to an effect, an affect the drinking water catchment. One of the first was Port Stephens Council, and within Port Stephens Council's area is an important drinking water dam for the city of Newcastle. They now have planning control over what activity might occur. It took a lot of effort and a lot of uh, contentious debate to, to allow the councils to have this power. Other risks that could be controlled with good sanitation planning in Australia and in New South Wales is the risk of cyanobacteria or blue-green algae to reduce the input of nutrients into waterways and with that to reduce uh, not only algal blooms but the turbidity in streams. Just a few weeks ago, I learnt of an outbreak in the Grenoble region of France that occurred in March last year. I thought I would include it because I think it has some similarities to Havelock North and it certainly has some similarities to some of our vulnerable supplies in Australia. Beautiful uh, series of towns in the foothills of the Alps. There was a doctor, uh, Gerard Cardin, who was responsible for the health care to uh, a nursing home, an aged care facility. And he, un he noticed an unusual number of cases of illness, 15 of the 42 residents and the, the nursing homes pictured on the top right. The day that he noticed this in March last year, which was a Friday, he asked some important questions. He contacted a neighbouring school. They had 150 students of 600 absent and sick. He then spoke to the pharmacy. The pharmacy had a very unusual number of people coming in unwell, looking for medication to, to help with vomiting and diarrhoea. The school's in the lower photograph there. He contacted the regional public health agency immediately. This was on a Friday. It took until the Sunday to issue the boil water alert um, because tests were carried out to confirm whether indicator bacteria might be found to test the hypothesis. The doctor was quite convinced given the, the distribution of cases that water was the likely cause. The municipality distributed water. 
the regional uh, public health authority required the implementation of a water safety plan, which they then announced through a press release. And the boil water alert remained in place until the uh, following Wednesday. The source of the water is a, a, a groundwater um, catchment that is in a, a, a cast uh, environment, so fractured limestone, anything that happens on the surface moves very, very quickly into the groundwater and um, in fact through a public meeting it, it became uh, known that the, the council and the regional council had known for some time about this vulnerability. The contamination was traced to a sewage treatment plant serving a small hamlet higher than the town and close to the groundwater catchment. This sewage treatment plant was putting out rotavirus and norovirus in its, in its uh, effluent streams, which are photographed in these, in these stream discharges, and the village is photographed there. Um, some very neat epidemiology and an amazing openness on the part. I emailed the, the commune, the smallest level of government, about two weeks ago asking for details of this in my very rough French. And they, they sent back a massive report that they shared at the public meeting of more than a thousand people saying this is 47 PowerPoint slides that we showed to our community one month after this happened. And we told the community that we knew in 2014, two years prior, that there was a need to expand the groundwater protection zone. They had had a risk assessment carried out. They knew the vulnerability. They were dealing with two levels of government hire, the prefecture, to get the clearance to put in place the planning controls. Um, there was a vulnerability that was appreciated. We have this in New South Wales. We have towns now that we know are vulnerable. We are prompting the utility to deal with the risk through their treatment where they can, but we, we need, in some cases, fairly expensive treatment upgrades to deal with the potential risks. There are challenges dealing with existing land uses, and there are also challenges in the expertise knowing what water sources might be truly vulnerable and what, which ones are less vulnerable. So, in conclusion, Water safety planning and sanitation safety planning provide a methodology to think through potential hazards and to work in an intersectoral way to bring incremental improvement. It's rare that problems are solved quickly. But with uh, goodwill and with persistence and engagement, it is possible to protect communities and to protect their health. Thank you.